Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, career drummer with Weird Al Yankovic, John Bermuda Schwartz, and now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities, sunny Los Angeles and Music City, USA. Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Buddy, how you doing? I miss you, man. It's been a while. This yeah. Is well, you know, I, I know you always have about... Can you hear me eight- okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Your, your mic sounds great today. Uh, you usually have about yeah. 8, 9, 10, 11 balls in the air as a business owner, as a voiceover artist, as a husband. How you doing it, man? What, what, what's the secret? Is it whiskey? What are you doing? Let's keep them all in the air and two in your hand. <laughs> now, I tell everybody, that's me on a depth, but I think it's the same depth from Laugh USA on Sirius, uh, on the Sirius network. But hey, seriously, let's get into this because I always say I'm excited. But seriously, yeah. I'm excited about getting with our, all of our guests. But, you know, this gentleman is rarefied air because he's been playing with the same band members and the same recording artist for 40 years. I want everybody to put their hands together and welcome our friend, Mr. John Bermuda Schwartz, longtime drummer for Weird Al. How you doing, buddy? Oh, great, Rich. Thank you for having me, Jim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, man. We, this is uh, a long time yes, coming sir. because we, we see each other at uh, industry events and we're social media buddies and we're always kind of keeping tabs on each other. But it's so nice to be here in this virtual room and get to talk about all things music and motivation. Yeah, what, What's happening with you? What's going on? Uh, well, lately, like a lot of us, not much. <laughs> 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 not, not much musically. Uh, actually, 2020 was a very good year for me in terms of uh, working on my book, finishing up the book and getting that out, right. which is something I've had kind of on, in the fire for a couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thankfully I had something to do. But uh, yeah, musically, it's been uh, terribly quiet, as we all know. Well, for the folks that are just kind of consuming this with their ears, you are set up in your living room and there are gold and platinum records all over the walls. Oh, uh, well, Al has sold very, very well, thankfully. And, uh, and not to brag, that is not all of them. We didn't have a big enough living room. So there's some <laughs> in my office. There's some uh, in, in the hallways. Uh, I haven't put one in the bathroom yet, yeah. but uh, that's next. You know what? I have a couple in my Nashville house. I have a couple in the bathroom. I am, s- yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting. It make, keeps things interesting for the people that are. Really? Yeah, you know, it just gives you something fun to look at. They but typically, not t- uh, it's where you come up with your best beats. Well, Jim, I know Jim has Jim got a squatty potty or two for like a birthday or something, and he's he loves it. So, but his family's always like, "Get out of there! Get out of there, buddy! You're in there too long." How did you know that, buddy? I've known you for twelve, thirteen years. We do this twice a week. I know. <laughs> he loves those buttons. So, tell us about the book, the book yeah, Black and White and Weird All Over. Black and White and Weird All Over is a coffee table book that, uh, that uh, was published back in November by 1984 Publishing, that, who specializes in uh, pop culture coffee table books, so perfect. And it's a book of uh, my black and white photos of Al from uh, the early days, from 1983 to 86. And uh, it was the only time I shot black and white on him. But I always had a camera with me. I mean, like from, not from day one, but literally from day two, I always had a camera and was always taking pictures. And he was, I don't think he ever told me to not take pictures. Yeah. I was the only one with a camera on video sets and in the studio for a long time before we all had, you know, our, our cameras with us. At sure. all times. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got, I've got, you know, tens of thousands of photos, but these, these are special for two reasons. One, they're the only black and white ones I shot of Al. And two, none of them had ever been published. A couple of them, literally like seven or eight of them had been published, but the rest of them had not been seen. And, and I had done Al's website uh, starting back in the nineties and oh, yeah. put out a lot of photos and, and, you know, stuff, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but all color. And all in in terribly crunchy web quality, especially at a time when screens were like 640 by 480. So if you put a 300 pixel wide picture up, that took up half the screen. Now it's like really tight, you know, so they're useless now. But no one's ever seen, you know, 
and, and the photos that had been published, a couple had been published, were never seen in the quality that they appear in the book. Well, so the book a, is special yeah. for a couple of reasons. Sure. And, uh, and, it's just, and it's a very nice book. You know, it's got nice pages and it's, you know, it's a heavy book and it's, it goes on the coffee table and it's just, it's very cool. And the, the response from the fans has been great. So I'm, I'm very happy with it. That's amazing. Well, the pictures are beautiful and you sent me a copy and I was kind of perusing that whole thing. And I'm, I'm sure that Weird Al is pretty happy now that you had that camera and you had the camera bug back then because you've kind of become since day one, the official archivist of the band. So videos, designing the websites, curating photos and the black and white photos. Tell me, there is something about that, that it just is so classy and timeless, black and white. I love it. It, it, it lends a certain vibe, you know, mm -hmm. and, and particularly not that 34, 35 years ago is a long time, but I mean, it sort of sets it back in that era a little bit because there, there are a lot of color photos that I shot. I carry two cameras yeah. with me, one yeah. color, one black and white film. So there are, for a lot of these photos, there are kind of color counterparts, you know, that were taken a few seconds later or later in the day, whatever. And, and those have been seen and that's all well and good. But, you know, to, to see the black and white really takes you back and and it's just it's got a certain vibe it's got a certain feel a certain documentation to it which is what i do i, I document things you know not not deliberately i just do it just because that's what i do i mean i always am taking pictures still you know just now with the phone yeah and there's a you know you know joe travers right and uh, oh, yeah. so he yeah. does he does a lot of that stuff for zappa the zappa family a lot of archiving and he's kind of like a librarian and says they're pretty cool it's a, it sounds like a, a covid proof job <laughs> <laughs> well, so seemingly, I mean, certainly this book was, I mean, happily, now it was in process before that, that hit us last year, early last year, and uh, happily, it, it didn't really change anything. Sure. Uh, it came out pretty much on schedule and uh, moved forward and, and uh, you know, sold well enough uh, for Christmas, and we'll get another shot this year. And, I love uh, that. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you have a hobby, man. It's always nice. People are like, what's your hobby, Rich? And I'm like, do you think I have time to build ships in a bottle? I'm running a couple of businesses here, running around playing gigs. Um, but it's, it's always great to have, you know, to have a hobby. But now you've probably been asked this a million times. The same guys, the same artists, 40 years, that is such rarefied air. You guys probably, I know, I've been playing with the same guys for 21 years. We finish each other's sentences. It's probably just got to be an amazing thing just to be on stage rocking those songs with uh, with your boss who champions you who gives you all this flexibility and you have all these guys on stage that you're great friends with that that is what is that feeling like it's it's so it's like home for me it just it, it makes it nice you know it yeah. makes it not be work yeah. you know we're really just we're just playing together and yeah there's you know three four five thousand people watching us do it up there and you know and, and it's it's sort of an organized jam really i mean yeah. you know it's just it's a lot of fun and if it wasn't fun you know i i would uh, i would ask for more money so no you know what it's it's still fun it's still a lot of fun and and we get along and it's a family you know it's it, it is a family and uh, tell us about the guys in the band who are they well, we got uh, Steve J on bass, who's right. uh, a terrific bass player and, and does uh, his own music. He, he does sort of uh, world music, uh, funk, uh, fusion-y, rhythmic, uh, uh, you know, very, very kind of musician's music, you know. Sure. Uh, we got Jim Kimo West on guitar, and, and Jim is a big fan of Slack Key. In fact, he's well-respected in the Slack Key world and, and goes to Hawaii and does a lot of stuff. Like, they need to import white guys into Hawaii to play Slack Key. <laughs> well, Jim does that, you know, he's very well respected in the genre. Uh, um, and, and he's a terrific uh, sound design guy as well. On this last album, Steve is too. On this last album, uh, all of the parodies were done by me and either Jim or Steve, all on keyboards and, and guitars and basses. But it was all, all the sound design was done by the three of us. That's great, and and so he's really so Jim's really good. Uh, can can play anything. When you say uh, sound design, what do you mean? Well, in in terms of creating, uh, usually in terms of samples and sequencing, creating and reproducing sounds. You know, make basically making right. up sounds. Yeah, uh, it's like being a producer that has the ability to. Is it like to, being a foley artist? Uh, in in a sense, yeah. You know, you know what that would be. Yeah. yeah. In other words, it would be like being a Foley artist if you wanted a door slam, but you figured out a way to do some other different sound that made it sound like that. That's right. what we have to do because we don't always know what the sounds are that we're reproducing. So yeah. we have to create, we have to think, what would I do 
to get that sound, you know, rather than, oh, I, I know what they, I know what keyboard they used. I know what drum sample. It's like, no, I, we have to start from scratch on that stuff. And that's the design part. I mean, I consider myself a sound designer uh, as well in regards yeah. to drums and percussion. Well, and, and, I, I, and we got one more guy in the band. Yeah, he's yeah. the new guy. Uh, uh-huh. He's been with us uh, since 1991. Yeah, he's the new and, guy. And uh, so he's the new guy. He takes a lot of heat from us. That's for Ben Vogt. He's the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, relatively speaking, you know, he's coming up on 30 years or, or to whatever it is now. Man. And uh, 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 that's Ruben Valtiera. And uh, he's from the Bay Area, uh, Santa Cruz uh, area. He went to school and, and loves, loves his Latin and jazz music yeah. and uh, record, you know, works on his own stuff. The three guys play their own stuff. You know, they all have other musical things that they do and that they love. Uh, I just play drums. I don't write music. I don't, you know, I don't have, you know, I'm not trying to sell my own songs. I just, so I'm very happy in my role just doing that. But they all have other stuff they do during this time off. Now, but when when you say you're just a drummer, I got to tell people that your band, and this is not a slap in the face, this is a compliment. You guys are essentially one of the greatest cover bands in the world, and in, in the sense, Weird Al's music is a it's parody music, so he's coming from the angle of uh, instead of beat it, it's just eat it and. Going, right and so it's so it's a slight it's it, so but you're tipping your hat to the original production sonically drum parts that kind of stuff and oh, then, yeah. like, making it your own a little bit and then of course very much so he's making it his own so your versatility as a drummer you're covering everything from pop to polka and everything in between it's very impressive well, thanks. And actually, in the terms of parodies, you know, yes, he changes the words. Uh, we don't have the luxury of changing the parts or even the sounds. You know, and that's that's especially lately, lately, the last 30 years where sequencing and, and sounds have really come into modern production of, right. of hits. We've had to copy that. We've had to do that as closely as humanly, mechanically, you know, computerally possible. And that's so we've all grown as, you know, I've, I've grown as a as a uh, musician, as a, a sequencer, as a sound designer, because I've had to go in and copy those things. If we get 99% sounding just like the song, the original song we're trying to do, that's pretty good. The goal is 100%. But 99%, it's like, yeah, I, I, and, you know, not too many people will notice. Yeah. But Al notices, and we notice. You know, we mm-hmm. can, like you mentioned, eat it and beat it. Well, of course, that goes way back. That's back to 1984. Uh, you know, if you listen to the two together, they don't sound that close i mean you know it's funny people say oh you guys sound just like michael jackson it's like uh, not not quite well we got a lot better and now when people say oh you sounded just like imagine dragons or you sounded just like uh you know pharrell or whoever it is or you know robin thick it's like yeah that's that's why we get paid the big bucks jim did you have a question i saw I mean, you there you, i think he's asleep yeah, i mean I, it's funny back oh. in the day <laughs> Was, Zoom is slow today. today. It's really <laughs> your Wi-Fi connection is, is it bad. Today. It's bad. Is it lagging? I'm sorry. That's cool. You it, look fun. Back in the day, there was uh, in the um, in the uh, when I, when I did radio, uh, one of some of the things that we used to do were not parodies, but we would revamp some of the songs that we would play to include the radio station identification and call letters and stuff like that, especially with Jack FM and to replicate mm. those vocal parts. Like I did um, the queen song, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, the wow. big part where they have like, you know, the 13 different vocals that expand out. And they, just to do the vocals is a, a massive chore. I can't even imagine the instrumentation. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a lot of work you know, and it's yeah. a lot of fun. But it's mm. it is a lot of work. Uh, there's been some songs that have been very maddening for me, <laughs> and and uh, therefore when I actually get it, it's like I'm very proud of myself, uh, you know, for for having worked through it and figured, not figured out what the original producer did, but you know, figured out a way to to make it sound like the original, which again is is our job. Yeah. That's what we do. Sure. Now, is there a a favorite? Uh, recording studio in Los Angeles that you guys kind of made home or just weird out have his own place or now are you guys sending files to each other? How has that all changed over the years? Well, in the beginning when we were signed with uh, Scotty Brothers who was distributed by Epic. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm all choked up talking about the old days. Uh, <laughs> they, they had an in-house studio uh, in Santa Monica, not mm. far from where any of us live. And we recorded uh, just about everything there. The very first album was recorded on spec before we even had a deal. Uh, uh, 
Rick Derringer's manager, Jake Hooker, got us that deal and uh, and uh, installed Rick as our producer. And we're like, yeah. uh, that's uh, pretty cool. Okay. You know, this was like 1982. So... Uh, we recorded that at Cherokee in Los Angeles, a famous, famous studio. Condos uh, now. Uh, c- yes, the Cherokee condos are so- horrible. <laughs> uh, somebody's in there with garage band or acid, so that's like what's left of the studio now. Exactly. And uh, but we got signed to Scotty Brothers uh, actually at the end of that year, and uh, recorded a couple more things for that first album in their home studio, in their in-house studio with their in-house engineer Tony Papa, who's pictured in the book, by the way. Yeah. And. Uh, we recorded our next several albums there just because one, it happened to be a great studio. Now it was still on, uh, you know, uh, analog tape then, uh, had big Neve board, uh, you know, digital was just starting to creep in a little bit. And, uh, eventually, uh, they sold off, uh, their catalog to, uh, Sony. They, uh, and, and us along with it, uh, the building became something else. And uh, we moved on to uh, a couple of other studios in LA. One of my fa- one place that we recorded the last few albums, the, the drums in particular, was at Westlake Audio in the Michael Jackson room, Studio D. It was mm-hmm. Michael's favorite room, and there was there was a couple of suites where he could go hang out away from everything and, and all that. Had a se- had a not so secret but a, a separate entrance from the parking lot, and you know so he could come in and, and go out without going through the lobby or going out the front. And that was my favorite room to do drums. And Al was very good about going in there and paying big bucks for that room for one day so we could go in and, and cut three or four or five tracks. You yeah. know, and, and whoever could get their work done in that room that day was done. And then the next day, you know, it came time to do guitar overdubs or vocals or whatever could be just done direct. He would go into like a production suite, you know, which was a lot cheaper yeah. and, uh, and finish up in there. But he was very good about indulging me in Michael Jackson's uh, room. Now, and what area of la- town is that, bud? That's that's in West Hollywood. That's on Santa Monica Boulevard near La Brea. Wow, that's like right up the way. Is it still there? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how busy they are, but it's yeah. uh, it's still there. It's been exactly. a couple of years since I've been in there. And the very last album we recorded was uh, at Dave Way's uh, Way Station. Uh, Dave Way is an engineer who's worked with uh, Ringo and Christina Aguilera and just and a, and a ton of people. And we went into his basically home studio. It was nicely set up, but a, a home studio. And he's got, he has a bunch of the basses and guitars hanging on the wall and a couple of pianos in there and some keyboards and some drums with some various snares, a bunch of cymbals. Sometimes I used his stuff. Sometimes I brought my own. But we cut the whole album there. Uh, we cut all the originals there. All of the originals were live performances. All of the parodies were all programmed, in which case I then – basically emailed files, emailed yeah. stems. We all did that. You know, of course, we all know, you know, okay, the count off is going to be two bars. You know, this is the tempo. You know, when Al says it's going to be 180, what he really means is this. He means it's 90 because he thinks in terms of eighth notes. Uh, eighth notes, yeah. Stuff like, so we have, we've learned how to, how to uh, figure him out. Yeah. But we send all that in. We know if there's a key change, we know the exact arrangement. And because uh, it's not always exactly like the parody, but musically and, and sound-wise it is. You know, yes. it's just he may cut a solo in half, for example, things like that. He may ca- cut an intro in half. But all of that stuff was done. We create all those files at home, and then we send those in. Yeah. Now, and, for uh, the drummers in the audience, uh, this you've probably been asked this question a million times, with us just celebrating um, – the Beatles, 1964, just the other day. Did you watch that performance? Was Ringo your guy? Uh, I, I, I was. I was like seven years old. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, you know, families after dinner, you know, sat in front of the TV and watched Ed Sullivan. I mean, we just, it was a religious, that's what we just did every Sunday night. And so I, I saw the Beatles. and hadn't really heard of them before that. And, and watched them the next, I think they were on three weeks in a row. And, uh, Saw that, and and yes, I, I became sort of a Beatle fan, but I wasn't yet a drummer. I was actually like like playing accordion. I think I was taking accordion lessons then. And your brother was playing drums, right? Who later uh, switched to guitar. Right, and when he switched to guitar, I inherited his drums, and that was in 1965. Wow. And by this time, I already had some Beatles albums, but my parents also had uh, like Gene Krupa albums yeah. and Latin orchestras and Alan Sherman records. So I had a, a sense of comedy early on, you know, not you know, a sense of parody. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, so I, I listened to all of those things. And, and at that age, it was just all music. It was all good. You know, I didn't really say, oh, this, this stuff sounds like it's 20 years old. Like, I don't want to play that. You know, it's like, I just, it was all good. Yeah. So I listened to the radio. I listened to my Beatles records. I listened to Gene Krupa records. I mean, I just, I, I had a lot of influences. Uh, but absolutely, Ringo was, was uh, one of a couple of my big heroes. And Hal right. Blaine would be the other one. Absolutely. God, and I, and I got to meet Hal a couple of times. What a character. Talk about quick on the wit. Yeah. You yeah. always want something like someone like that on your recording session because he can lighten <laughs> the mood and he can keep it light. And it's like, look at guys, we're not digging ditches here. And then, hey, here's another one I like I got from the Catskills. Count it <laughs> off. You know, I mean, if, I, who wouldn't want to do a session with that guy? Uh, everyone did. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and he was such a great guy. I was at his 90th birthday party a month before he passed. Uh, at the Big and, Potato? Yep. You know, I wanted to go. I really, really wanted to go. And if I had been more informed watching my Instagram, I would have known about it. Because at the time, I was renting a place right by the Hollywood Bowl. It was a mile from there. Yeah. yeah. So was it a fun night? It, it was. It was very cool. I think he had a good time. We took off a little early. Yeah. Uh, we took off before he got up and played. He actually got, and I asked him early on, I said, they're not going to make you play. He says, I hope not. And uh, they did. He got up and played. Uh, I, I think he probably did be my baby yeah. and he uh, I think he did boots are made for walking and there's a couple of like handheld you know videos of him doing that and he sounded pretty reasonable for a guy that probably you know hadn't was really that? played in a long time right right you know and was on the spot and yeah. was a month away from passing I mean he was just he was in remarkably good shape yeah. uh, my brother and I actually he had been out uh, out here a couple of years before and we uh, went out to see him uh, went out and had lunch with him, and, and he told – and my brother had worked with Hal quite a bit back in the day. Now, now fill the uh, listeners in on uh, your brother and his musical legacy. I, I, I've, I learned the hard way about this. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what? No, you're, my, my, you're Bermuda Schwartz's brother? <laughs> Have you worked with Richard? No, it's on the list, though, because I, you know, living in Nashville 24 years, I would see his name on, like, say, Steve Earle's Guitar Town, you know, and I'm like, who's Richard Bennett? Well, he's John Bermuda Schwartz's brother. <laughs> oh, that Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Rich, Richard has, has uh, he, he grew up in the studios here in L.A. Uh, he was sort of on the tail end of the Wrecking Crew. In fact, there's not Hal's Wrecking Crew book, but there's another Wrecking Crew book that has Richard pictured in there because yeah. he worked with all of those guys. In fact, my very first recording session at age 13 was with Al Casey, Richard on guitar, and wow. Steve Douglas on sax, Steve from the Wrecking Crew. It's yeah. like Wrecking Crew guys. It was very cool. Anyway, uh, but, but Richard was, was uh, working around the studios and stuff. He hooked up with uh, Neil Diamond's band very early on. Uh, stayed with them for quite a while, all the recordings, all the tours, uh, did more recordings with him after he had left uh, that, after he'd moved to Nashville and got very busy in Nashville, sure. uh, worked with Amy Lou Harris and, and Steve Earle and, and Rodney Crowell on the Cherry Bombs and, and uh, Vince Gill and Leanne Womack and just, you know, and in LA had cut stuff with Ringo and the Four Tops and, and the Letterman and, uh, uh, let your love flow. That's Richard on the guitar wow. at the beginning. Nice. Uh, he had just done, he's done a, a ton of stuff. I mean, a, a remarkable amount of stuff. And when he moved to Nashville, and they were bringing him out to Nashville in the mid 80s to cut stuff. And, and it, like you need to import guitar players to Nashville. Yeah, I know, right? it's Guitar Town. Hello. And, and uh, they decided he, he picked up his family and rented a house for a year to, to see if it was a viable move. I don't know if he was tired of LA or it was just sort of a new opportunity or, you know, his roots were in country. So maybe it was sort of back to that. Yeah. A little bit. And, uh, in a very short amount of time, he decided to stay and, and became one of the top call guys in town and uh, hooked up with some of the guys that worked with Mark Knopfler and went out starting, I think, in 94, became Mark Knopfler's second you know, in line on guitar and Fantastic. recorded and toured with him yeah. uh, right up through uh, the 2019 tour. And uh, he's just, you know, and then, of course, this last year, everyone's just kind of been sitting. He is now starting to get back into recording a little bit. And, uh, you know, socially distancing stuff and, and stuff, yeah. you know, just. Oh, I've been going to do my mask sessions in Nashville. It's like, you know, and it's so weird seeing your friends and colleagues that you've known for 24 years. And you're like, probably should stay six feet back. I don't want to. Yeah. I want to give you a hug, you know, yeah. but it's so weird. It'll be back. It'll come well, back. It'll come back. So, so uh, did you, you're a native Los Angeles guy, right? 
Well, no, we were actually from Chicago. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then uh, uh, moved to Phoenix uh, oh, at an early right. age, yeah. and uh, which is where Richard hooked up with uh, a guy named Forrest Skaggs. Skaggs had a music store, and he, he took uh, guitar lessons there. I think probably drum lessons. I took drum lessons there as well. And Skaggs had taught Al Casey how to play. Al Casey was from Phoenix. Dwayne Eddy. He taught those guys how to play. So when, when Richard was in high school and he graduated high school, for, uh, Skaggs sent him out to hook up with Al Casey, who had a music store at Santa Monica and Vine. Yeah. And, uh, and Richard went to work in the music store and, you know, did lessons and worked behind the counter and stuff like that. And Al would, uh, you know, Al was uh, the busy guy in town, Al Casey. And, and sometimes if he was too busy, he would send Richard out on a session. And gradually, Richard began to become the session guy. And that's, that's how that all began for him. Yeah, the blossoming of a session career. Well, that's fantastic. And then, um, so you got some drum lessons, and you're kind of off to the races. And then you've probably told this story a million times. But you could do a quick version of it. How did you get the, the, the gig with Weird Al? Uh, I met Al on the Dr. Demento show. Dr. Demento did his live show in L.A. Right. at the time. And uh, I, I met him there. And it was actually through Richard that I got to meet Dr. Demento. And then Dr. Demento said, oh, would you like to, I had sent some stuff to Demento back in the 70s uh, with some musical friends and they got, they got played on the air. So Demento, and by this time, by 1980, uh, you know, he was playing a lot of homemade stuff on the air. He says, oh, do you want to come on the show and, and uh, I can interview and you can talk about the band you're in now and, and uh, about how, you know, the early stuff you sent in. I said, yeah, I'd love that. So I came back September 14th, 1980 and Al was there. Weird Al, who had become, who was one of those guys who was sending in homemade music and become very popular on the show. Mm. And, and he was there at the show that night. So, and I'd heard of Al, of course, you know. So I did my interview and all that. Well, Al had written a song that weekend and uh, wanted to play it live on the air. And Dr. Demento had set aside a little spot in his top 10 countdown at the end of the show. And he says, oh, we, and, and Al had, had uh, you know, and there's a sort of a cast of people there that, you know, hangers on and people that would answer phones and stuff. And I got to beat on his accordion case for the song he had written. Right. There's a parody of Queens, Another One Bites the Dust, called Another One Rides the Bus. So I beat on his accordion case <laughs> and went out that. live on the air. Happily, fortunately, wisely, Dr. Demento rolled tape on that. Nice. So we have a, a real recording of it. That became a single. Anyway, that night after, after uh, we were done, I said, uh, you know, that, that was a lot of fun. You know, you should have a band. I'll be your drummer. And, <laughs> and him not knowing, he said, okay. So that's that's basically what happened. And I, I I wish I could tell you, you know, I saw this great future for the guy. You know, I had no idea. It just seemed like fun. And, you know, I was just yeah. playing around town and I had a day job at the time. And it's like, you know, it's just another sort of musical avenue. Yeah, you gave, him the, they, you gave him the soft sell, as Jim would yeah. say, because Jim is a big sales guy. Uh, yeah, but it, it was in no way was it intentional. I mean, yeah. it just was it's something I blurted out. Well, so I, mean, I could, I could have very easily just walked out of there, said nothing, and, and have never right. seen him again. Right. But that one thing that you did, you took a chance, and it changed the trajectory of your life forever. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can't say that I would not be playing drums now. Uh, I probably would. I love playing sure. drums. Yeah. But, but probably not at a level where you would be talking to me on a show. Right, right. <laughs> and... <laughs> The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. 
Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. And what do you think the key is? Because we do have a mixed bag of listeners, but uh, for the drummers out there and even the people that just want to cultivate a successful career, what is the, what are some takeaways or what are, what, how are you able to keep a job for four decades? Oh boy. You know, it's, I guess by doing the right thing. Yeah. What, and as a drummer, the, that would be. What, whatever, and whatever it is, you, you got to be flexible. You got to have right. discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to, you got to keep an open mind, open ears, open eyes. Uh, you, you got to, you got to be able to, to kind of do it all. Sure. You have to be able to do it. You have to be willing to do it. There's a lot of guys I know, they won't do certain gigs because they just, they don't want, you know, they, they, I guess that's the artist in them. Oh, I don't like that kind of music. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play. Well, then don't complain when you don't work. Or yeah, they're, they're, or they don't want to show their Achilles heel, which may be like, ooh, my Achilles heel is jazz, Latin, funk, and reggae. Dude, you ain't gonna work. You just shot yourself in the foot. You lost forty yeah. percent of your work. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be willing. You gotta yeah. have discipline. Oh, we gotta have talent. I mean, that's sort of a given. You know, you gotta have an ability to to do the job, but you have to be willing to do it. And not everybody's willing to do it. You would think, you know, who would who would walk away from a, a career in music if that's what they want, you know? But people do that, and I I don't get it. You know, I just I don't understand it. I'm thrilled to to be able to do it. I don't apologize for you know playing with a guy that does parodies. I mean, it's uh, you know anybody that knows him or listens to what we do or has seen our show understands the high level of production and quality and meticulousness and seriousness that he puts into what this is i mean yeah. he's, he's he's a long way from just getting up there with the accordion and these velvet patrick pants from the 80s and and jumping around and being screwy i mean it's become a very very serious venture and the fans are i'm sure ravenous uh they are and, i mean i've seen fan art of you and it's not just like <laughs> one picture from some japanese guy it's like from people all over the world doing caricatures of you and fan art it's pretty cool Oh, thanks. Yeah, they, they uh, I mean, it's the, the fans have been great. I mean, and, and they view us as, as a unit, yeah. which, which we, you know, we are well, technically, uh, you know, it's, it's the artist and then it's the backup band, although it's the same band all these years. Uh, but the fans don't view it. They don't separate Al from all of us. We are all one act. That's really great. And, and we all get the same respect and the same treatment and, and the same adulation. Yeah. And it's it's very very cool. And Al does not have a, a star thing going on at all. You know, he seems uh, like he's a very warm, approachable guy. Almost yes. like you guys would have um, a Weird Al's uh, annual Christmas party. Am I right? <laughs> not, well, not last year. <laughs> and, right. uh, <laughs> not the year before, and actually not in any of the previous years. But <laughs> no, you know, we uh, uh, we could. I mean, we're we're all friends. I mean, I, I see them as much as possible. You know, probably the last guy I've seen in person was Al couple of months ago uh, but yeah it's it's we could you know and yeah. and uh you know the, the uh, we're all married all, all the wives get along it's 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 a good thing i mean it's it's rare have it's you guys rare. done um uh, a certain number of dates per year or has the um the dates if they come down, like as a young man, you're like, yeah, I'll do 220 dates a year. No problem. And then you get to the point where it's like, we're going to do 50 shows this year. Yeah. We, we just, uh, you know, we're all at the same level. We were 20, 30 years ago. So oh, we're fine going out and doing a bunch of dates. A bunch these days means 60, 70. That's you know? nice. That's very uh, manageable. Somewhere between know, six, yeah. 50 and 80 is very manageable. Yeah. I mean, uh, there've been some years we did a lot more. Yeah, uh, I think in 2000, we did uh, 200 some odd dates. Um, you know, that was a very busy year. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 dates is, is fine. And we don't tour every year. In fact, right. 2020 was our year off. Uh, we toured in 18 and 19. Uh, 20 was going to be a year off. We were going out this year. It worked out perfectly. And, uh, and that has, uh, we were actually supposed to be out now. Yeah. 
and that that got moved to later in the year which got moved now it looks as we're looking like uh 2022 yeah and that's going to be a more that that will mm-hmm. take place of the 21 and 22 tours that will be uh, a longer tour that's the that's the goal anyway yeah. but we all feel and, and you know we all feel like we did 30 years ago you know we're all al jumps around on stage and we're all excited to, to travel around and be on the bus and still get a thrill from being in front of the audience it's not just a bunch of old guys collecting a paycheck right no it is guys- it is but it's not just that it's fantastic <laughs> it's fantastic and you seem like an incredibly loyal guy in the sense of your your the companies that you've aligned with you're a big ludwig guy have you been with your companies the entire time uh, no, I mean, there have been some change-ups. Actually, yeah. Ludwig is one of my newer uh, Oh, it is? I thought you were like one of those like WFL lifetime guys. Well, I, I was a Ludwig guy, you know, a, a, a fan since the beginning. My first sure. drums were Ludwig's. My yeah. second drums were Ludwig's. I've owned a lot of Ludwig kits over the year, but I didn't start endorsing them until 2006. Huh. So it's been a relatively recent uh, thing. Um, uh, I, I've endorsed Sabian Symbols since 93. Nice. And that's that's a uh, that, that's a long time, you know. Uh, Vic Firth sticks for uh, twenty years or so. Did Evan you get some of the uh, pepper years. and salt shakers? I do said? actually. Oh, yeah. You know what? I I have those. Hal Blaine gave us those. He who he had got them from somebody, I guess. And and we were having lunch with him, my wife and I, and and we went out to walk him out to his car, and and uh, he opened up the trunk and gave us these Vic Firth salt and pepper shakers, which that's is awesome. so cool. So a gift from Hal. We use them every day. Yeah, they're, so, they're, they're super high quality. And, yeah. uh, and so what about the, some like drum heroes, like even contemporaries that you really enjoy that maybe have become part of your uh, rhythmic roux, you know, your own recipe, you know, that you kind of like steal from. Like Jim was a huge, God rest his soul, Neil Peart guy. And I was, in, I've, I've, everybody loves Neil. And uh, I was a Stewart guy. I was an Alex Van Halen guy. Mm. I loved Gene Krupa. My dad loved the big band, still loves the do 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 I mean, how do you, you cannot, you're dead if you don't like that. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I, I listen to that stuff. I don't really source much of what I do because I don't do that kind of stuff. I mean, and, and it's not, it's not cause I don't want to, I just, I don't ever get asked to either by Al. Although actually there was the closest we got, we did cherry pop and daddy's zoot suit riot called yeah. Great Fruit Diet. So I got, I got to do a little bit of that. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I didn't do it as well <laughs> as Gene would have done it or as well. You got to chuckle uh, out of Jim on that one. <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, that's actually the cool thing with Al. I get to do a lot of, different things it's it's not all two and four in real life in in uh you know my the bands i play with in town uh it's it's all it's blues and rock and oldies and stuff like that and and a lot of that stuff is very straight ahead and it's the stuff i like playing as well because again my my heroes and they've stuck with me all these years still it's still ringo it's still hal blaine you know i still steal stuff from them and it works because what they did is the right timeless. thing they, yeah they, and it's timeless yeah. not time not yeah you know, Tempo-less, timeless. Yeah, and- like, uh, bop, doo, doo, bang. like I tell my students, I say, look at, you know, you put some tea towels on your drums, you go, bop, doo, 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 doo. you're in business. I mean, you're off to the races. Yeah. It worked for Ringo, it worked for the Beatles. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love the fact that you'll, you'll schlep some drums around and, and go play around Los Angeles. I mean, you play in places like Molly Malone's and oh, yeah. joints yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love- no, I'm, I'm in like four bands here in town. Uh, not over the last eight months, but yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 months. But, uh, you know, I, I, I keep busy. And, and happily, all these bands, you know, I go off and tour. Al is always first call. And they got plenty of notice. They all go get subs. I come back to town. I, I get right back into these bands, which is, is very loyal on their part. They don't need to have, you know, somebody in there that comes and goes and comes and goes. I mean, maybe my name has some, has, has some cachet for these, these bands, you know, and they're happy to have me back. You know, it's not like there aren't other great drummers in town. Nice. So I'm, I'm very. I, so I've been in some. I've been with one guy since 1981. Uh, That's great. Uh, recording and, and playing with him, you know, and he's and one of the subs that he's got for me when I'm gone is uh, DJ from X, DJ Bonebreak. Oh yeah. And so who's a very accomplished player, uh, a melodic, you know, does stuff. Uh, I think he produces. So that's very that's very cool for me to know that it takes DJ to come in and do my gig. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, looking back at your amazing body of work, many records, uh, a lot of awards, a lot of accolades, do you have a couple of songs that you say, I'm really proud of that? That's a legacy item. Uh, a, a lot of them, some of them not so much. There's, there's <laughs> one song, there's one song in, you know, anything where, and not just playing, but anything where I've programmed it and I've really nailed it, 
I'm very, very proud of. So now, what are you using the program? Like, a, like an Akai or like a, a Pro not, Tools or a drum machine? Not. I, I've been through a lot of different things. I mean, I started with machines back in 85. Right. And uh, graduated to an Akai S900, which was the hip-hop producer's, you know, number one tool. Right. You know, of course, I didn't have a bank of them. I had one of them. Right. Uh, then moved up to a Kurzweil K2000. And, you know, I, I've had some hardware things. I did a bunch of stuff in Pro Tools. Uh, I, you know, programming MIDI and Pro Tools, which is people go, <gasps> MIDI and Pro Tools? Yeah. I, yeah, I, it's, it's great. It's simple. It's powerful. You know, I tried Logic on a Mac. Could not, you know, couldn't figure it out. It was stupid, yeah. stupid Pro Tools. Great for MIDI. And eventually, I sort of got really dumbed down since I was dealing in physical, you know, uh, uh, samples, wave files, and stuff like that. I just started lining stuff up in Acid in Windows wow. and just lining up tracks as they will appear in the studio and, and just export those stems. You know, most of the stuff that's programmed goes in four-bar cycles anyway. So oh. I would create my four bars, do whatever I was supposed to do, cut and paste that to, you know, three and a half minutes or whatever. And my, my thing was done, you know, and that was it. Yeah, so these, I, I, I do it kind of the hard way. I mean, it's really not, it's not even MIDI anymore. Hey, whatever gets it done. I mean, these crazy yeah. kids nowadays with the trap hats, you know, the 64th notes. No, yeah. You know what I mean? I think they'll are 64th notes. I mean, I'd have to experiment. I mean, you can uh, play a nice uh -huh. little pressed seven-stroke roll to, to, on the hi-hat to get away with it live. <laughs> but to program it, I haven't done anything like that. Jim, you look, everybody looks at Jim and they're like, is he, Jim, what Jim is doing is he is researching things and he is taking show notes as we speak. But I feel like there's a question brewing in you. I've always wondered about the near misses, the parties that didn't quite make it oh to, my God. to, uh, to public. Oh, well, there, there are Anything a couple of those, actually. <clears throat> well, one in particular was uh, we did a song. I, I forget the guy's name, but it was a song called You're Beautiful. Oh, yeah. You're beautiful. Um, you're beautiful. Uh, you're beautiful. Right. So we yeah. did uh, You're Pitiful. <laughs> Hey, at least it wasn't about food. Anyway, yeah, no kidding. so we thought for whatever reason, I guess we thought we had permission or something or, or Al did have permission. I mean, we don't normally move forward on something unless he's sure. And, and at the last minute, Atlantic came back and, and said, uh, no, we're stepping in. We don't, you know, we want to work his career. We don't want a parody of this. And, you know, that's, and we had actually already recorded it. So the wow. next day, Al, I mean, it was, it was done. It was mixed. Al put it up on his website, and we found all of the other fans that had their own Al websites. We gave them the file and said, go ahead and post this. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anything they could do because it was, it was Al's recording, and it was free. He wasn't trying to sell it, and mechanically, he owned the recording. So we gave, we gave it away, and we did it in concert anyway. And I forgot the guy's name, but he's long forgotten. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, that's the He's gone, kind of thing. and Al's not. So there and you, you uh, it's almost like a, a badge of honor these days if Al covers your song. I yeah. Mean, well, it, 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 it's like you've arrived. Well, it, it, the, Kurt Cobain said that, actually. Yeah. He says, you know, you know you've made it when Al wants to do one of your songs. And uh, I, I assume he said that before he died. Oh, yeah. And Hopefully. Afterwards, yeah. maybe not so much. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, Afterwards, yeah, it very, probably sounded like... <laughs> <laughs> well, ba back in the day when product actually sold, it was not only a badge of honor, it was like extra stream of income. Because, you know, we would sell a million records. You know? So yeah. that, was, that was a good thing. That was a bunch of money in, in the writer's pocket. Yeah. Uh, so at least 100 bucks. Well, uh, you know, that's better than Spotify. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It's a different. It's a different. I'm world being today. tongue, tongue no. in cheek, but man, I may have struck a nerve. I'm sorry. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, you know, uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, bands have to go out and play for their money. I'm gonna give, my, you know, most I'm gonna give myself the uh, Kelsey Grammer on that one. That was a stick. <laughs> Kelsey <laughs> Grammer falling down the steps. Kelsey that's Grammer Jim's favorite. That's that's him falling off a stage. And the yeah, the Price is Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, 40, 40 years in the music, 40 years plus in the music business, you're going to see a lot of changes. And when that pesky Napster thing started to happen and Lars Ulrich was in a tie in the courtroom, like things were changing. It's like, yeah, yeah. you got to go. How do bands make a living now? You either when lace Lars your, Ulrich shows he, up in a tie. He, in a did, I, I don't think know. he was in a tie, uh, but um <laughs> You know, you got to license your music to TV and film, and you got to take the music to the people. You got to travel. You got to put butts in seats, and then hopefully they're going to go and buy a sixty dollars hoodie at the you know the merch table. And they do, yeah. And they do. They come in, and and you can't you can't give that stuff away. Oh, we could, you know, it's, well, it's not coming out of the, my pocket, but yeah, you know, you know it's, but no, cool. but you're right. It's that's that's the way to make money. You still yeah. have to charge people to come through the door. You know, they want to buy a T-shirt or or a button or a sticker or a hoodie or whatever, and and that's where the money is. And it wasn't always there. You know, it was there, but it, it helped promote record sales. You know, or actually, you would sell records and then people would want to see you in concert. But either way, you got to sell records. Now, yeah. you almost, you put out recordings, give them away, basically, and yeah. that encourages people to come see you live. Yeah. And that's encouraged. Well, cool. well I, yeah, I want to say- what well, they did. Back oh, about a year and a half ago, they put out their last album, the first, I want to say, in- I don't know, was it eight or nine years that they put out an album? Crazy. And they have such a they have such a rabid, uh, you know, tribal type of fan base that their album actually beat out Taylor Swift's albums. That's crazy. So they wow. had album sales, physical album sales, and they did it with digital downloads. So if you bought the album, you had the ability to go and download videos and apps and things of that nature that came with the album. So it was very interesting the way they did it, and they they kind of reinvented. I, I would imagine that Weird Al would be able to do the same exact thing because he's well, such a yeah, rabid follower. I, yes and no. I mean, there's there's anomalies to you know records not selling. I mean, obviously Taylor's Swift stuff, you know Justin Bieber and the other other Justin, all the Justin's albums, they all sell. You know, yeah. not as well as they would have ten years ago or twenty years right. ago, but relatively speaking, they're selling very well. Uh, our last album uh, was a number one album. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 awesome. album chart. Yeah, with with sales of like 104,000. Now, yeah. you say number one album. Well, you guys are rich. Number one album. We still owe the label a bunch of money. Is yeah. what that oh, means. Right. At 100,000 units, that's that's not very many. Actually, it, these days it is. Yeah, if you can but sell 100,000 you, units these days, you are rock. Yeah, but 20 years business, ago, 100,000 would get you dropped from the label. Absolutely. But from a business point of view, do you even need a label these days with the kind of uh, equity and market equity that he has? We don't have a label. That album, you do went on number, your own. album went number one, and that was the last album on the contract with Sony, and Al said goodbye. Yeah. Wow. Number one album, goodbye. So he can go. just do it, he can distribute himself. Uh, yeah, he uh, absolutely, absolutely. He knows how to he knows how to promote himself. You know, he can get yeah. stuff on Apple Music and and wherever it needs to sell. He can target a release date. He can do all that stuff. He can coordinate. Here's where, the in the past, only labels really had that power with those outlets. Right. Now, a, a, an artist that they know can actually sell product, they'll work with them. You can target a specific date so you can promote it. And, and here's Al, the thing: Al can do he, that. he's the last guy. He's kind of laughing all the way to the bank because. The albums are consumable. People want to buy the entire album because it's it's entertaining. It's it's yeah. fun. It's content, and every song has got value. Whereas a typical artist, I'm like, eh, I don't want to sit through the other eight or nine songs. I'm, I just want the hit. Give me the hit. I'm good. Well, and and uh, the the record collector in me uh, kind of enjoys that because I bought thousands of sure. albums mm -hmm. to you know with with one or two good songs on it and a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And back in the day, and for a long that time I did, off. I was very happy to go pay for the tracks I wanted and not right. have to buy the whole album. There's still some yeah. artists where I will buy the entire album just oh because gosh. of who they are. Like Pearl Jam's third album, I was like, dude, this is a freaking coaster. Just <laughs> <laughs> This is awful. What, what are you guys thinking, you know? Well, there goes our chances of getting anybody from Pearl Jam. Um, but anyways... <laughs> So, so John, did you uh, keep all those albums that you bought? Do you have like a, yes. a record room? Uh, Are you like an yeah. audio file where you're dusting your albums not, and you, you're cleaning the needle and all uh, that? Not quite. Uh, no, I've got about uh, 3,100 CDs and about 1,000 LPs still. You kept all your CDs? Wow. Yeah. I mean, I totally drank the Kool-Aid. People were like, here's my CD, man. I'm like, dude, I don't have a CD player or DVD player or anything. I'm all Spotify and devices <laughs> like the kids. 
No, crazy. I still have I still have a physical, and I'm I'm not above downloading something if I want it. Yeah. But I still have a lot of physical uh, product. I still have my old techniques SL. 1200 Mark II turntable from 1985. <laughs> uh, Jim, you know what that is. And, and uh, you know, I have, I have a nice, you know, audiophile sound system here. And uh, I still have all that music. And I got rid of a lot of CDs. There were a lot of CDs that had that one song on it that I wanted. And I'd make a choice. I'd go, am I ever going to listen to anything but that one song? No. So I'd rip it off the CD, and I've combined them down to about five other compilation discs with about 100 songs on each right. and uh, DVDs uh, with the files. And that's where about 300 of my CDs have gone. Yeah. So, and I actually kind of only did that because I was running out of shelf space because I was still buying CDs. Wow. Yeah, physical space. You know what, you know yeah. what we need to do at some point? You know how these, vi- how these reaction videos kind of take off on YouTube and mm. such? People experiencing something for the first time. Mm. We need to do something along the lines of that with 15 to 20-year-olds experiencing vinyl in the truest sense of it and actually <laughs> feeling the music. Mm. You know how we used to do back in the day? I mean, it, was, it just had that yeah. sound. It had that magic <laughs> to it, you know? Well, and yeah, you had something you could look at and that was big and that, you know, maybe had a booklet in it or yeah. had liner, real liner notes and had a lot of lyrics. I guess you yeah. have that on CD booklet. You don't get that with a download, of course. Not, yeah, poor session anything. musicians these days. Yeah. It's like, you you know, you, you get into this, you know, hallowed ground of this club of people that are actually playing on records. And then unless someone really goes to figure it out on all music or something, no one knows who's playing on the records. Yeah. I don't know if, if um, you know, John Smith in Middle America cares, but um, I, I loved having it. A, a lot, a lot of people don't care. Yeah, you know, uh, right now. But that's yeah. okay if they I, if I, they I, enjoy what you do. It's okay, you know. They don't need to know, you know. Our fans don't need to know who we are. For example, yeah, yeah, they right, do. Right. That's why they're fans, and and you know, not sort of casual fans. Even sort of casual fans, after all these years, know our names. They know who we are. Well, but John, it's almost like a. a Not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I mean, they had a lot of, if you remember back in the 70s, they did artist development, right? They they would would spend three, four albums developing the artist, and that's how they really grew. I mean, you you came up in that era. They they started turning back on that. If you didn't have a number one album, they, they dropped you. So it's almost like it bit them in the ass as they move forward uh, with the digital revolution. What is, <clears throat> with all you guys being involved in this, what are some of the conversations being had around what the solution is? How do you get back to being profitable? What's any plans being discussed or technology coming down the pike that hmm. give us the inside track on it all? Or? I don't know. What do you think, John? There might be some think tanks going on in some very lofty places we don't know about with like passwords and such to get in. But uh, I mean, I think for the most part, we're all just, we've all just realized that music is free. People will pay dollar 99 for a fart app but they won't pay 99 cents for a piece of of art it's like the sweat of someone's brow a story that's being told and set to music and we just have accepted that and we go okay we are going to go play live that's that's the last choo choo stopping ground for the music business and actually for and for me that's okay you know yeah. i would much rather play live yeah. than to p- go play a song one time and then sit back and wait for my nickel to roll in i yeah. i want to i want to be out playing you yeah. Know? So I, I'm fine with playing. And if that's where the money is, uh, that's okay, too. I mean, we wouldn't go out and play for free. You know, we don't want to make music for free, but, you know, we'll go out and, and you know, we're not going to we're not going to make an album or much of an album and, and with the intention of giving it away. I mean, the intention is to sell it, even if it means, you know, just making up copies and bringing it along and selling it on the merch table. You know, it will be sold. You yeah. know, it's not we don't consider that just a promotional tool that's to be written off somehow. That's got to stand on its own. And, and be paid for in some way. Is radio still relevant, you think? Will it be relevant in the next 10, 15 years? Hmm. Who knows? It, you mean terrestrial radio? Terrestrial. Yeah. You know, because that's, that's kind of the distribution methodology that gets everybody familiar with new music. I mean, right. is it Spotify and Pandora now? Have they taken the place of radio? No, you think? I, I think there's people out there, you know, who don't always have that streaming thing with them. So there's going to be people, although, you know, the big, uh, you know, the iHeartRadio, uh, you know, syndrome, you know, will yeah. they're feeding, they're helping to feed that. Again, they're, and they're playing the kind of stuff that people will buy, not in giant numbers, but they're playing a lot of the dance and, and a lot of the hip hop kind of stuff that's, 
that does actually sell and a lot of the extreme yeah. hop that, that actually does still sell. Yeah. Even TikTok is breaking artists now. Wow. You know? Yeah. Now they're, I mean, it was they're YouTube forever using, and yeah, so now yeah. TikTok. I mean, well, I, I like... I like to drive around LA and listen to Spanish stations so I can work on my Spanish. You know, it's like, it's fun, you know? <laughs> no, I, I think, I think there are, there are, you know, distribution channels. I, do they amount to anything? I mean, anything is good for exposure and no. getting it out there. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Does it amount to anything? Can it get anybody to pay 99 cents or $1. twenty-nine in the end? That's, that's the real question. You know, getting it out there is, you know, that's free and easy and that's all well and good, but will anyone pay for it? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Well, know. you know, Jim is going to queue up the random question of the day while I ask you the fast five. Try to give this to us without thinking. Favorite color? Blue. Favorite food? Chicken. Fa <laughs> what? <laughs> favorite, uh, favorite song? That's a big one. Pump it up. Yeah. Elvis Costello. I okay. Oh, yeah, that's a great one, man. It just uh, popped into my mind. Favorite movie? Uh, 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 that Thing You Do. A joyous. A joyous one. <laughs> and then you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but if you're brave, favorite place to make love? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, boy. Uh, okay. cheap, cheap motel. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, cheap motel. Yeah, the first thing you do is you take off that horrible bedspread. Because <laughs> that thing can stand up. To and take it off? Oh. Oh, yeah, take it off because it can stand up and walk around by itself, and you do not want to see it with a black light. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. It's like a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> totally. Ouch. <laughs> Jim, we paid for this jingle. Hit it. The random question, random question, random question of the day. Okay, now. The uh, Fast Five, followed by a random question. And this yes. is truly random. Okay. What would you do if one day you woke up and every person was just gone without a trace? Whew. Ooh, that's, that's heavy. That's heavy. Uh, you, mean, you mean universally gone? Just no, gone. no Facebook, no nothing. It's just... Bermuda. Wow. Well, so many opportunities. Uh, <laughs> possibilities. I don't, I don't, wow. I, I don't know. Yeah. We have to figure uh, out how to make fire. You'd have to like, I have made fire. You're like Tom Hanks. No, you oh, well, you, you, you mean going you, to make fire. Well, you, you know, do you mean like waking up in the house and, and no one's around and no one's in the world? You know, I still couldn't go into the fridge and go make some breakfast or, or just waking up out in the middle of a field and, and there's nothing around me? Yeah. No repercussions. Oh it's just you. Fire. Fire's a good uh, thing. Good start. Yeah. Uh, water, food, clothing. I'm, I assume I'm naked. Um, See, this thing no, got you, deep really quick. Yeah. yeah. Boy, I don't, that's, that's a tough one. That should just be your question. You're never going to get an answer. That should just be your question every show. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, whoever whoever does answer it gets to host the maybe show. We should have <laughs> not the uh, the red. Maybe we should not do the random question. Maybe it's the philosophically deep question. Sure, that would be yeah. Because that was that, that what, while it was a random question, that's that's. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time for that. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's been the subject of the Twilight. Uh, there was a Twilight Zone episode like that. There's been a couple of movies like that. 28 Days Later, the dude yeah. wakes up naked. There's zombies all over the place. I mean, <laughs> right up my alley. That's um, the thing is that would you wear clothes? I mean, what, what would be the point? No, I, I mean, true. I mean, I'm self-conscious enough that I want some sort of like a little Planet of the Apes little doily or something. But if no one's around <laughs> to see you, what's the difference? That's true. You could just shake it. That's right. Yeah. Shake it, shake it. Have you guys ever do that one? The, um, no. Do, no. Do, 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 oh, we did do Taylor Swift though. We did uh, uh, "You Belong to Me." Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Called yeah. Uh, TMZ, the, oh, like yeah. the TV show. Absolutely. Oh. Now your website is great too. Is that just BermudaSchwartz.com? Uh, yes. Everybody check that out because it's like you're. It's like you are. You could tell you're a historian and an archivist because you have 
every act you've ever played with, every record you've ever yep. played on, every television show you've ever played. I mean, and it's like, I'm pretty good on my website, but there's <laughs> things missing. I mean, it's, it's great. And there's t- all the fan art is on there. It's a great site. So everyone check that out. And the book is Thank called you. Black and White and Weird All Over. You can get it wherever nice coffee table books are, are sold. Amazon? Amazon? Oh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, independent bookstores, uh, Books a Million, my et cetera, God. et cetera. You had me at Walmart. And Jeff Bezos is, you know, he just, I mean, everybody. He's an author now Stepped because in. of Jeff Bezos. Is it Bezos or Bezos? Uh, it, 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 I'm sure he's good either way. He does. Yeah, he's he. <laughs> that with his guy money, he doesn't care. Is fine. I think, that, I think it's Bezos. Yeah. He he just stepped down from Amazon. He did. Did he well, put somebody else in there? Yeah. Well, well he stepped down from in, that position. He's still on the board. I mean, he's gotcha. still working. Yeah, he's not CEO anymore. Right. But, I, uh, I don't know what that was about, but whatever. Do you it's, actually have a line of Bermuda Schwartz? shorts that you sell bermuda shorts uh no no i should that's not a bad uh i do you know what i actually have shorts from bermuda i have bermuda shorts from purchased in bermuda and sent to me to go do a thing in bermuda which unfortunately got canceled last year it's it's a great nickname i love how you embraced it did you did you have to do anything legally with the state of california with for your name or no i i uh no, I didn't, although my driver's license does say John Bermuda Schwartz and, and credit cards say Bermuda Schwartz and checking and all that stuff. Wow. And it's become, it's a professionally known as. And uh, so it's it's a, as legal as it needs to be. It's just, it's not on my passport yet. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's fairly legal. Man. Well, we'd love I'm this time, you, man. man. We'd love this time with you. And, and are you on the socials? Are you where the kids are? Do you want to be found on the Insta and all that yeah, stuff? I'm, I'm on Facebook, uh, Bermuda Schwartz, facebook.com slash Bermuda Schwartz. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I don't use Twitter much, but I'm on there. Uh, mm-hmm. The Great Bermuda. Nice. And Instagram as well. I don't use too much, but I'm on there as well. Uh, the Great Bermuda, at The Great Bermuda. And, uh, you know, I just, but Facebook is kind of my, my thing and, and, uh, you know, I, I haven't really looked into TikTok at all or any of yeah. these other things, but, uh, you know, Facebook is fine for me. Yeah, no, it's we're the, we're the right age to be Facebook users. Yeah. All the key crazy kids are like, I'm not on Facebook because my parents are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these kids. Yeah, he, you know, even, even Al has sort of gravitated towards Twitter. That's become his main thing. Oh, yeah. You know, Twitter and Instagram. Microblogging because it's like cool. It's, uh, you know, you're around the water cooler. You know, you're expressing opinions yeah. and it's quick. And he's got like 5 million followers on oh. Twitter. That's amazing. So that was pretty cool. That really is amazing. Uh, well, man, thank you so much yeah, for your time and talent and 40 years with shared. the same artist. That's great. Oh, Fantastic. thank you, Rich. Thanks, Jim. Jim's yeah. got a lag today. He's got a serious <laughs> lag. But that's, that's yeah. Jim's way of saying, I love you. Great. Oh, yeah. Oh. Look at him. Look at it, Jim. We love you, man. Thank you for your time and talent today. And everybody, check out the book, Black and White and Weird All Over, BermudaSchwartz.com. Send Bermuda Schwartz a message on Facebook. And, uh, man, keep coming back for the good stuff. We're going to be here. We appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, John. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Jim. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.